Hello everyone. I am Iman Ben Amor, PhD student at Avignon University. And today uh, in this lecture, I will present you a part of my uh, PhD work uh, entitled BILR Towards an Interpretable and Explainable Approach for Speaker Recognition. This work is supervised by Prof. Jean-Francois Bonastre and it is funded by the partnerial ch uh, chair uh, Elia Avignon. So I will start by uh, defining speaker uh, recognition uh, process. It is uh, the process of uh, identifying whether two speech recordings belongs to, uh, belong to the same speaker or not. So um, generally, speaker recognition systems rely on uh, deep neural uh, networks to extract speaker embeddings, and then uh, taking those uh, two speaker uh, embeddings that they represent the uh, speech uh, recording. We compare both of them uh, using similarity score. It could be cosine similarity or even uh, likelihood uh, ratio. Uh, so as uh, application of uh, speaker uh, recognition, we can, uh, we can find um, uh, those uh, systems in uh, banking applications, uh, like biometric voice uh, recognition or even in forensics uh, uh, with um, uh, comparing uh, or analyzing uh, two uh, voices to identify the uh, criminal. So this second context represents the inspiration of my PhD work. And here I will present the, this context, which is the forensic one. So let's imagine that in a crime scene and among the traces that we have, uh, we found a vocal trace in which the voice of the criminal appears. And from a list of um, suspects' voices or recordings, we compare the trace voice recording and the uh, suspect uh, recording uh, for this, we use a forensic voice comparison uh, system. This system is phase two, uh, two hypotheses. So we have the first uh, hypothesis, which is the prosecution one. So this uh, hypothesis says that the trace sample, sample belongs to the suspect. And another uh, hypothesis, which says that the trace sample belongs to someone other than the suspect. And uh, using both uh, hypotheses, we calculate likelihood ratio, which is the ratio between the uh, likelihood of having both recordings given the first hypothesis, divided by the likelihood of having both recordings given the defense hypothesis. So uh, with this likelihood ratio, we pass to the log. And then we will have a score, uh, which can be uh, either uh, positive, which means that the two voice recordings uh, come from the same speaker, so it's target, or uh, negative, which means that both voice recordings come from uh, different speakers, which means non-target. So um, given... Uh, the trace and the suspect voice recordings, um, a forensic practitioner will uh, analyze both recordings. He will use, for example, um, automatic approaches such as score-based or feature-based uh, approaches, or even uh, manual analysis of both uh, recordings. And he will report uh, a score, which is the log LR, for example, here in this case, it is equal to five. And he will give this value to the judge. Uh, in the court, the judge uh, will interpret this value as uh, um, the evidence or the, the trace that we have supports five times the prosecution hypothesis more than the defense hypothesis. But he can't uh, infer other uh, interpretations, so he will ask many questions, such as 
uh, is this value is reliable? What, on which information this value is based to be calculated or estimated? What are the factors that contributed to this final uh, value? And what are their intrinsic specificities? So with only this score, there is a lack of evidence interpretability for the judge in this case. So, however, what if we give to the judge, we say that we have X and Y voice recordings. Each voice recording, we will represent it by a binary vector, where each dimension represents a characteristic. One means that the characteristic is present, and zero means that it is absent. So imagine that we have only four uh, characteristic, and for each one, we, ca we calculate a function. If, uh, for example, for the first uh, characteristic nasality, we have F011, because it is present in X and Y. And we, we have for this uh, characteristic two parameters, which are the typicality and the reliability. So we know that the nasality, for example, it is less typical. It means that it is rare in the, in the reference population that we have. So we have very few peoples that have a nasal voice. And we know also that the reliability of this um, characteristic is 0 0.7. It means that uh, for this characteristic, we didn't, we didn't have a lot of errors. W and uh, with, with both parameters, we have, for example, a score for just this characteristic, which is equal to 2. It is big compared to the others. It means that we have um, uh, a positive uh, contribution of this characteristic to the final score, which is the uh, final log LR. And if we see the other uh, characteristics also, we can uh, proceed in the same way. So with all those information, we can say to the judge that this log LR is calculated as the sum of all those uh, scores. Each partial score is related to one characteristic, and we know the specificities of this characteristic. To finally get a, a, a value for this uh, score, which is one. So that's why we said that the decision of X and Y is that they come from the same speaker, so they are target. So that's what we wish to have at the end. So to, uh, to, to modelize this, uh, this uh, wishes, so we proposed uh, BALR, binary attribute based likelihood ratio, which is uh, an approach that uh, provides uh, an interpretable and explainable uh, score for speaker recognition. This approach is composed of three steps. So the first step consists in representing uh, speech represent uh, speech um, speech signal by a binary attribute based representation. So each each voice recording will be represented by a binary vector. The second step is uh, to present the LR scoring as an interpretable. Um, uh, in an interpretable way, so it's to decompose the uh, final LR score as the product of the partial LRs. Each partial LR is a function of the specificity of each attribute, and each error LR is associated to an attribute. And the third step is the uh, attribute explainability, so we want uh, uh, added to that, we want to explain the nature and uh, we want to describe the phonetics that are uh, embedded or uh, that are existing in each attribute. So 
let's start with the first step, which is the uh, binary uh, representation of speech samples. So to, th to do this uh, binarization, we, um, we, st we started with uh, a baseline uh, ResNet extractor, uh, which is the X vector uh, system. Uh, so it is the uh, commonly used uh, system uh, for uh, speaker recognition in uh, literature. Um, so we took the uh, so this system consists in uh, taking the uh, speech uh, sample, extracting filter banks, and then um, give those filter banks to ResNet. So like that, we will have a frame level uh, representation, and then we pass it to the polling layer to have a representation at the iterance level. And then we have a fully connected. And for our case, we add an activation function just after the fully connected to obtain sparse vectors. So in the general uh, case for the X vector system, there is there is no uh, activation function. There is the fully connected and then the speaker classification. And like that, we train the whole system to finally extract a speaker embedding for each speech sample. So by adding the soft plus activation in our case, we obtain sparse vectors. Uh, it means that we have in this vector values or zero. And uh, this is all is done during training. And after a training, we uh, binarize the, this sparse vector. So we, re we replace the non-zero values by one, and we keep one values. And like that, we obtain a binary vector of size 256 uh, bits, where each dimension represents a binary attribute for our case. So um, to calculate the uh, LR uh, score, we propose to uh, do uh, the multiplication of all the partial um, LRs, where, where each partial LR corresponds to uh, an attribute. So to be able to do this multiplication, we need to verify the independence assumption between attributes. To do this, we... Um, we verified this uh, assumption with two metrics, uh, not metrics, it's two correlation um, metrics. Uh, so the first one is the Pearson uh, correlation in the first figure. And the second one is the mutual information. So uh, for the first one, the first figure, it is uh, the correlation values between attributes uh, that are obtained uh, in the sparse vector. So we calculate the Pearson correlation between the dimensions. And we obtain values which are uh, very weak. It's, uh, they are between uh, minus 0, 2 and uh, 0, 3. And we checked also the mutual information. But this time, it was between the uh, binary uh, attributes. It, mean be it means between the dimensions of the binary vector. And we obtain a very weak uh, mutual uh, information, which confirms the independence between the attributes. So uh, here we pass to the next step. But before uh, going to the next uh, step, which is step two, um, do you have any question until now? Or everything is clear? Yes, please. Can you go one slide back, please? Um, well, it, it looks like there is some features are correlated. So, um, h how did you come up to the conclusion that uh, the features are independent from based on the graph? So, um, it depends if you mean that 0 0.3 um, means that they are correlated. To which extent? For instance, I mean, it's like, it seems like medium correlation or like there is apparently there is some correlation. So, um, this is just the, the you interpret that that there is no correlation, or how, how do you in explain that? I interpret that 
as there is a weak Weaker. correlation. Uh -huh. Th that's how I quantify it. But I can't say that there is zero correlation. Okay. And uh, maybe follow-up question, what if the features are correlated? What do you do then? Then we should change the extractor or we should add a, co a constraint in the extractor that push the uh, system to uh, obtain uh, decorrelated uh, dimensions in the vectors. All right, thanks. A little question, what are the axes in the graph actually? What is on the x-axis here? Uh, so, the y-axis is the correlation values, okay? And the x-axis uh, is nothing, it's just the, it's the just a violin uh, plot. Right. Uh, maybe, <laughs> I don't know if you are familiar with that, but it's, it's the distribution of the uh, correlation values and we can look only to the y-axis. Okay, thank you. So, okay. I pass to this next step. The second step is how to calculate the uh, partial LR uh, scores, which are uh, interpretable, and I will show how uh, they are interpretable and why. So, the LR uh, scoring uh, process consists in, in the first step, to extract the binary uh, vectors from uh, two speech recordings, where each dimension represents an attribute. And then we have a second step that is to calculate the uh, behavioral parameters, which are the typicality and the dropout that I spoke about uh, earlier s uh, uh, of each attribute. And for uh, to calculate those uh, behavioral parameters, uh, we use we, we calculate them on uh, the train data to have a bigger view about the um, uh, about the information in our reference population. And then, for uh, each attribute, we calculate a partial score based on the case of x and y. For example, for bea zero, we have uh, zero. Uh, zero, it means that the attribute, the first attribute is absent in x, in x and y, so we calculate LR0, uh, zero, zero, and etc. So that the final LR will be the product. Uh, don't worry, I will uh, explain each step in the next slide. So, um, the first uh, step after extracting the binary uh, vectors is to calculate the attribute behavioral parameters, the typicality and, uh, and the uh, dropout, or let's say the reliability. Uh, so first, uh, to model the discriminant power of attributes or the typicality of attributes, we have the first parameter, which is the typicality. We define the typicality as the frequency of speaker pairs sharing the attribute in the reference population. Let's take one example here. Imagine that we have a reference population, that is our uh, population. Uh, each uh, person have some characteristics. And uh, for example, for um, the star charac characteristic, the blue star characteristic, uh, it exists um, in uh, three persons. So we have typicality that is three uh, divided by 10. So it's like that how we model the typicality, but with bigger reference population, of course. The uh, other uh, parameters, they are, uh, they are uh, related to the reliability, uh, to quantify the reliability of uh, the attributes. The first parameter is the dropout. And we define the dropout as the probability that an attribute does not appear in a given iterance while it was observed in at least one other iterance of the considered speaker. So we have an example here. Uh, so for uh, this speaker, we have a first iterance or a first sample of this speaker where we have the three characteristic, but in another uh, sample of this speaker, we have the triangle 
that disappear. So for us, this is dropout. This is a characteristic that dropped out from this sample. There is another parameter to modelize the uh, to model the reliability of attributes, which is the drop-in. We define it as the probability of falsely observing the presence of an attribute in a given speech iterance. So for us, dropping is related to the noise in the data. Uh, and um, as in this example here, the, uh, s this, speaker, this female speaker, it has uh, three characteristics. Uh, but there is another characteristic that we don't know where, where it comes that it appears. So for us, it is dropping. And for us, this characteristic is just noise. So to have an idea about the uh, behavioral, uh, uh, about the values of behavioral uh, parameters that uh, we, we have, um, those th the first figure here is um, a, a it shows the values of typicality and uh, dropout that we have. So for typicality, the y-axis is the values. So for typicality, we have this box plot. We have 25% of the attributes. They, are, they have very low, uh, not very low, it's medium uh, typicality. And for the rest, of the attributes, they have more than, uh, it's up to uh, uh, 0 0.99 uh, typic uh, of uh, typicality. They are very typical. And for uh, dropout parameter, uh, the values are uh, around um, 0 0.6, 0 0.7, uh, until uh, 0 0.8. Uh, this means that um, uh, the probability of error of uh, the attributes is quite high. So for the second, uh, for the third uh, and uh, final parameter, which is the drop-in, um, the drop-in is somehow uh, different of the typicality and uh, the dropout. Uh, if you notice, typicality and dropout are dependent of the uh, attributes, but the uh, drop-in, uh, as I said, it is related to noise, and it's something that we can't uh, relate to uh, attributes uh, directly. Um, so we uh, obtain the value of uh, dropping for all the data uh, in um, a way that uh, we optimize the uh, equal error rate of uh, a subset of, uh, of pairs. So, um, if I recap, the uh, LR, the final LR is calculated as the product of the partial LRs for each attribute. And the, uh, this, uh, uh, each partial LR is calculated as the ratio of likelihood of having the, uh, of the state of the attribute in X and Y given the prosecution hypothesis divided by the likelihood of having um, uh, the state of the attribute in X and Y uh, given uh, the defense hypothesis. And uh, to calculate those uh, partial LRs, we have four cases. Uh, we have the case where uh, the attribute is present in X and Y. Uh, if, we, uh, um, if we assume that um, X uh, y is the trace and x is the, the, the voice uh, recording of the suspect. Uh, so we have the case where the attribute is present in one sample and not in the other, and the case where the attribute is present in both of them, and the final case where the attribute is absent in both samples. So for each case, we have a formula for calculating the partial LR. So we will take just one uh, formula to explain it, and it's the same reasoning for the others. So here I take the formula for the case 1-1, uh, uh, where the attribute is present in x and y. So um <coughs> for the numerator under the prosecution hypothesis, which says that X and Y comes from the same speaker, we have we can say that we have 100 percent uh, of match because the attribute is already present in X and Y. 
under the um, defense uh, hypothesis, we um, uh, so uh, under the defense hypo hypothesis, we 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 are more into the hypothesis that X and Y come from different speakers. So we can explain the fact that the attribute is present in both of them by um, saying that there is uh, in this attribute there is uh, no dropout. That's why it is present in both of them, but actually uh, they are not coming from the same speaker. And uh, or we have another um, possibility which says that um, maybe the uh, attribute is not present uh, in X, but with a drop in, which is related to noise, it appears. Here I uh, give some um, uh, results of uh, the speaker recognition uh, performance of applying BILR uh, approach. Um, in the first table, I have the uh, description of uh, the used data sets. Uh, for uh, the training data set, I have Voxelab 2. For uh, the test, I used Voxelab 1. Uh, the uh, trials or the pairs of uh, uh, Voxelab 1, uh, SITW, and voices. Here we have the number of speakers in each uh, data set and the number of utterances and uh, trials. So in terms of equal error rate, we uh, report the performance of our approach. We compare it with uh, the baseline uh, X vector. So for Voxelab 1, for example, we have an equal error rate of 1.37. Uh, for x vectors uh, compared to uh, our approach that gives uh, 3.7. So we have a slight loss in performance uh, compared to the baseline. Uh, we have also, it's, it's, it's important also to uh, say that for voices, for example, for the x vectors, we have 3.96, but for uh, our approach, we have 4.7, which is not very far. So the loss in performance between the baseline and our approach is relative, and it is not always very um, important if 2% is important for you. Um, however, our approach uh, provides a very uh, interesting uh, interpretable uh, aspect. So for the uh, partial LRs that we uh, that uh, I already uh, presented, um, the formula. Uh, here I uh, present the values of the partial scores that are used to calculate the final uh, LR score. So here uh, is the distribution of the log LR, not LR. Uh, so I take all the um, speech pairs of Voxelab 1 that I used to calculate this 3.7 equal error rate. They are, um, uh, I have uh, 56,000 uh, uh, pairs uh, of uh, target and um, 56,000 pairs of uh, non-target. So I take, I take the values of the partial LRs for all those uh, pairs. So we have the LLRs of the state 0, 0. I remind that 0, 0, it means that uh, the uh, attribute is absent in both uh, samples. Um, so the absence of the attribute in the case 0, 0 gives partial uh, log LR uh, values around 0. We have this box plot um, where uh, most of the values are very close to 0, which means that the fact that the attribute is absent in X and Y doesn't uh, provide a very big uh, contribution to the, to the final LR score because the absence of the attribute, it can be a small, and, uh, uh, a small um, indices or it, it, can be, it can mean nothing, it's just absent. Uh, for the second type of uh, log LR, which is the fact that it is present in one side and absent uh, in the other, the partial log LR's uh, values are almost negative. They are uh, almost uh, under uh, zero, which means that 
the fact that the attribute is present in one sample and no, not in the other, it brings the final decision in the negative sense. It means that it, um, it, uh, it push it to be negative. It means it push it to be non-target. And for the case 1-1, one, one, it means that the attribute is present in uh, both uh, sample. We have all the values are positive, which is very uh, logical. So the fact that we have the attribute present in both uh, samples push the final decision to be uh, favorable for uh, to say that the decision is target for this pair. Um, so here, here I will uh, provide uh, just just a brief um, uh, uh, definition of uh, SHAP because I will use it to explain um, the final decision. So Jeff already uh, talked about uh, SHAP uh, earlier. So uh, here we um, modelize SHAP SHAPLE values um, uh, or we modelize our partial error rates as Shapley values. So uh, Shap um, explain and quantify the contribution of features to the model predictions. If we see here in this case, we have a model, a black box model, and we have some features. We give those uh, features and to the model and we obtain an output, which is the prediction of the model. And Shap, in its uh, way, it's um, it calculates the uh, contribution of each feature to the final prediction, which is 0 0.4. Uh, so those uh, polygons, uh, red and blue, they are the Shapley values of each feature. Uh, or let's say that they are the contribution of each feature to the final decision. Here we will use uh, SHAP to uh, provide a local explainability of the uh, final decision, which is the uh, final LR score. So we take two examples of target and non-target pair. So for the first one, we have a target pair. The final LR score uh, is 35.35. Uh, so we have a very big um, uh, log LR uh, value for this target. And uh, for the second example, we have non-target pair uh, with a value of minus uh, 18. Here, in those, in, two, in those two figures, we have the, the polygons in the figure represent the contribution of each attribute to the decision, to the final decision. Let's take one example. For example, uh, let's take the target pair. Here in the target pair, we have the first attribute, uh, which is the BA9. The BA9, uh, it is present in both samples, in X and Y, in this target pair. And the partial LR, uh, the partial uh, log LR, it means the value of the polygo uh, polygon is 2.43, uh, which means that it is high. And uh, the typicality of this uh, attribute is 0 0.15. It is, this uh, attribute is discriminant, it is rare. It is not very typical. And the probability of error of this uh, attribute, it is not so high also. So uh, the fact that an attribute like BA9, which is very rare in the population, and in this case, it has the biggest contribution to the final LR, it means that the final score that we provide is, drived, is driven by uh, attributes that are discriminant. So that's very important to know, especially for a, judge, for a judge, to understand that the decision or the value that we provide is uh, guided and uh, driven by significant attributes, not just by, by uh, attributes that are present in uh, all, uh, in all uh, speakers' uh, voices. So I will... I will explain uh, SHAP more uh, maybe in the lab session with a small, uh, in a small uh, notebook, so I will keep the rest of the result in this afternoon. So here uh, we provide a local explainability. Why a local explainability? Because here we have only two examples, two pairs, but here 
I will provide also a global uh, explainability which takes all the pairs and it calculates the average contribution of each uh, attribute to the final score. So here we want to see the uh, contribution of each uh, attribute in a uh, as a function of the typicality and the dropout, which are the parameters characterizing this attribute. Um, so each point in this uh, figure represents an attribute. Um, here we can, um, we can uh, infer that the attributes having the biggest uh, contribution are the less typical uh, attributes in the reference population. And uh, they have, so the dropout, I can't say that it is, uh, it is small, it is, it is already um, somehow uh, um, high for, for everyone, but uh, it is, it, it just indicates the weight or the, um, the reliable, it just gives us um, uh, uh, an idea about the reliability of uh, the attribute. But for the typicality, it is very interesting to know that um, my decision, the score that I provide, is uh, guided by the most contributive uh, attributes in all the pairs, not just in two uh, given pairs. So, any question before going to the third step? Thank you. Uh, maybe it will be in the next section, but if you can go uh, one slide back to the... Uh, you have like a very uh, non-typical example, uh, and it has a high co uh, contribution. So those are not the examples, they are the attributes. I said that the points are the attributes. So the attributes that are l rare or that are less typical, they have the biggest contribution. Uh, okay, but, but I think the question still holds, I'm not sure. But uh, if you are, doing, uh, you are doing it on, let's say, clean speech, and somebody will Sorry? give, uh, you are like working with very clean speech in your training data, and imagine uh, that there are like very few examples with, uh, I don't know, uh, like channel, uh, channel information, and somehow it, it matches with some speaker ID, let's say. Uh, will it be a like, typical attribute? Like, will, like the question is, uh, if you don't know what the attributes are, maybe you will explain in the next, next section, uh, like, uh, like how, how can you differentiate whether it's like noise attribute or like the core task attribute? This is the question. Actually. So we can't, I can't uh, answer to this question now because it will be in the next uh, part, but uh, until now, we don't know the nature of each attribute. So for us, they are, um, the attributes are uh, the attributes coming from a bottom-up extractor. They are extracted automatically. We don't know what they uh, encode as information, but we will discover that in the next slide. Um. There is a question here before. Sorry. Can you go back to the uh, violin plot? Um, the violin plot, you had it back quite In a few slides. In the first slides. step? Yeah, mean? Right. Okay. yeah. I mean, maybe I'm falling off the yeah. wagon right at the beginning, but here, um, I kind of worry about this. You've got a lot of correlations that are small, and you're trying to conclude that they don't matter. And I'm not sure, that it feels like a failure to find fallacy. Um, and I wonder if a better way to approach this would be from intrinsic dimensions. And you'd want to say that the number of intrinsic dimensions is pretty much the full rank. And that that would say that these correlations don't matter. That here I would think that if I had a million correlations that are all 0.1, then in aggregate they might matter. Do you follow what I'm saying? I don't think you can say just because there's a lot of small correlations, they don't add up to anything. Yeah. Okay. If 
I understood well what, what, what you say, is it's not because we have a, a small uh, correlation between all the dimensions that we could say that it's independent. We have to look uh, uh, one by one to the dimension and uh, maybe select only a part of a dimension which are not affected by that and say, okay, now we, we are independent. But intrinsic so dimension, I think. Intrinsic. Yeah. There's, a, there's yeah. a whole concept of it. There's a whole concept of intrinsic dimensions, which is how many dimensions do I need to cover the, the observations? And that's a more con a positive statement than to say I failed to find any, any you know. If I say I fully agree, and uh, before to go to the question, I if you um, uh, come back to your, le, le, your, your CHAP example, we could see that a, a lot of dimensions are contributing very fewly to the results. So, Certainly, one of the next steps is to select only a part of a dimension of a system and say the other are not interesting. What we do that, what we did, why we did that at this time is only because it describes what a classical system is doing on a voxel uh, test set. So we just apply exactly the same thing than uh, the other system, the state of the art, on the same database to give an explanation of also of what the other system are doing in the black box. But I agree fully with you, we have to come back on that. Um, oh, I forgot my questions. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, if you can go to the slide with the more, 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 uh, more, I think that was the la second to the last. Yeah, this one, uh, yeah, this one. Uh, so if I just understand correctly, dropout, the higher the dropout, the, the, the more unreliable a feature is. Okay, all right, okay, makes sense. Uh, could you maybe one more time uh, describe what the drop-in is? I, I didn't really catch it. So uh, drop-in, uh, I say that it is related to noise and uh, it is uh, the, the probability that uh, one attribute appears um, but uh, in fact, it is not uh, present um, in uh, the uh, the speaker samples. Yes, of course. Sorry. Uh, in fact, we took our example from a DNA. Uh, in DNA, uh, drop-in is the uncertainty due to the human manipulation. So you could corrupt, and and we t we are trying to keep this idea. You could corrupt the trace uh, when you are uh, working with it. So it's really uncertainty. And to be honest, except uh, doing uh, experimental stuff, we, d we have no idea to how to evaluate it, except that the fact in speech, we uh, expect to have a huge uh, link with signal noise ratio. Uh -huh. Dropout is not really uh, a reliability or error. Uh, it's and I, we have to go far from DNA to explain it. Uh, in speech, it's clear there is no profile. You can't have a complete profile of a voice, so even if I, you remark in my voice one uh, attribute, it's really probable that when you take uh, only three seconds of my uh, voice, you will not have the attribute. So somewhere the dropout is the frequency of apparition of uh, one attribute in, uh, in a voice. Mm -hmm. And for, for now, it's an average measure <laughs> uh, uh, until now. See. And maybe a second small question. Uh, if you can go to the formulas with uh, L LR, uh, what was TI? What's TI here? Uh, so sorry, uh, it's typicality. Typicality, all right. Okay, thanks. Okay, I uh, pass to this third step. So uh, the, thir the third step consists in discovering what are those binary attributes? What is the nature of these attributes and what is the information that is encoded in each attribute? So to do this, we have some requirements. First of all, those attributes comes from uh, an attribute uh, extractor that uses a bottom-up approach and uh, it doesn't provide any additional information on the nature of those uh, attributes. For us, for, for this extractor, it suggests some dimensions 
of the um, uh, of the extracted vector. And uh, we have another requirement that um, we uh, don't have labels. Uh, for for example, for voxelab one or uh, voxelab two, we have maybe the um, the gender uh, nationality for voxelab one. Uh, I think that we don't have another uh, labels. So we need an uh, an approach to describe those attributes without having any additional labeling of data. Um, the third one is that we need to handle a large amount of data in an automatic way. And uh, finally, we need to, the, our objective and our goal is to provide a meaningful description of the attributes uh, that we can provide to a speech uh, exp expert or to uh, a phonetic uh, expert to uh, explain um, uh, what is the uh, information or what is the uh, high level information that is encoded uh, by one at attribute or by uh, a set of uh, attributes. So uh, the proposed uh, methodology is uh, based on uh, this as uh, assumption which says that if we can identify phonetic variables that differentiate uh, so I have some mask. <laughs> uh, okay, if we can identify phonetic variables that differentiate speech um, uh, samples, so we can say that these uh, these variables are are likely to be uh, very good descriptors of one attribute. So the approach consists in um some steps so uh, in three steps the first step is we uh, select for each attribute some um, speech uh, extracts so we have our trained data we use the already uh, trained uh, extractor to extract the uh, binary vectors and then we do some selection so for each attribute we take the samples where this attribute is one we note those samples by um, uh, uh, S0, uh, S1, and we have another uh, set, which is S0, which is the uh, set of uh, samples where this attribute uh, is absent. And then, in the next step, we uh, choose some set of descriptive uh, variables that we extract automatically from speech extracts in both sets. And then we uh, select variables that best ex explain the difference between the two sets uh, using two approaches. So we use surrogate models and statistical uh, tests that I will explain more in detail uh, in the next slide. So uh, do you have any question uh, before I go to the um, uh, explanation of uh, the second and the third step? Okay. So for the second step, which consists in extracting descriptive variables automatically from speech extracts, uh, we use for this uh, a toolkit uh, which uh, which is the Open Smile uh, toolkit for uh, extracting audio feature, uh, audio, uh, acoustic features. Um, it is an open source audio feature ex extractor that computes acoustic features automatically. Uh, it is written in uh, C++, so it is so fast and it is so efficient and easy to use. Uh, and this uh, toolkit, it extracts more than uh, 6,000 acoustic features in an automatic way. So uh, for this work, we use uh, OpenSmile, but we use uh, just uh, uh, some s a predefined set of 88 uh, features only. We will not use the 6,000 acoustic features because it is so cost. It is. It, it takes a lot of time. So the predefined set that we use is called uh, extended uh, G maps. Um, OpenSmile is not the only toolkit that extracts uh, f acoustic features automatically. There is, for example, this voice, but 
I used OpenSmile because it is very fast and very um, efficient. So now we pass to the third uh, step, which is the description, the, auto the automatic description of the attributes. So to identify the phonetic variables that best describe uh, an attribute, we use two methods. Uh, the first one is the use of surrogate models. The, surrogate, the surrogate model that uh, we use are decision trees. Why decision trees classifiers? Because they are uh, fast and explainable by nature. Uh, th so this classifier will take the uh, set of uh, the S0, so the set where the attribute is absent, uh, and the set of um, uh, S1, where the attribute is present in uh, all samples, and it will try to classify both of them. And then we use an explainer from SHAP uh, Toolkit, which is tree uh, explainer. Uh, why we use tree explainer? Because more adapted to uh, tree decision classifier. And this one, it, it estimates the contribution of each descriptive variable to the classifier predictions. Uh, there is another method that we use also to be compared with the first one. We use a statistical test uh, method, uh, which is the Stepwise Linear Discriminant Analysis, SLDA. And it, is, um, it identifies a linear combination of the variables that characterize or separate the examples of the two classes, uh, S1 and S0. And this is done for each attribute apart. Um, and um, this statistical test, it starts by um, an empty set of descriptive variables and it, it, it calculates um, a, a metric and it adds the highest discriminant variable each time and see how the prediction reacts to this descriptive variable. Some results of both uh, models. So we took, I said that um, this uh, methodology is applied for each attribute. So uh, we have a surrogate, or a surrogate model for each attribute. Here we choose the attribute BA9. Uh, so for BA9, we have uh, uh, here in the X uh, axis, we have the families of uh, descriptive variables. So for example, we have uh, F0 um, uh, features. We have uh, the F1, F2, F3, uh, the others, I didn't put them, but uh, they are shimmer. We, we, we can have an overview of the uh, descriptive variables here. We have the shimmer, the loudness, uh, etc. cetera. So uh, the y-axis, in the first figure, represents the contribution of each uh, variable to uh, the BA9, to uh, the model of the BA9. It means that, uh, for example, uh, the F0 semiton percentile 20 uh, is uh, the, um, the descriptive variable that most contributed or that is very important or that presents the most uh, information of the BA9. Um, we can't also neglect the, the other uh, variables. Um, using the second uh, approach, which is based on statistical uh, test for BA9 also. So we have here the uh, lambda values, which is the lambda values, it reflects the uh, discriminant uh, ability of, um, uh, of each uh, variable, and in the x-axis we have the number of variables, which is 88 for uh, each model. So uh, if we take the, ten, uh, the first 10 discriminant uh, variables for BA9, we can see that there is some convergence between the results that we get from the first, mo the first uh, approach and uh, with uh, the statistical uh, test approach, and it's always the F0 that um, that has the most uh, contribution or that is the most present in uh, BA9 attribute. So F0 is most contributive for BA9. What if the BA9 encode gender information? 
So to answer to this question, I uh, have those two uh, figures, which represents the first one. It represents the partition of a gender in, the in both selected sets, S0 and S1 for BA9. So uh, for example, here uh, in the one uh, set in S1, which means that BA9 is present in all those samples, we have the proportion of, or the number of uh, female is bigger than the number of male. Uh, compared to the S0, where we have the inverse. I have also here another figure which presents the activation values of the attribute BA9 in test utterances that I grouped by gender. So for female, we have a very big uh, activations. Uh, in the y-axis, we have the activations, but they are normalized. That's why we have uh, values from 0 to 1. So uh, for female, all the activations of the sample is, uh, are very high compared to uh, the male uh, activations for this uh, attribute. Uh, here we have a more uh, global view about all the attributes, not just one attribute. So for all attributes, we grouped all of them here in the x-axis. We have the diff, uh, we have the uh, all the attributes uh, along the x-axis. We can see the differences between the attributes, uh, which reinforces the, hip the hypothesis that the attributes do not encode the same uh, phonetic information. We have some difference in the in the uh, colors for the uh, families of uh, descriptive variables, and along the y-axis we have some variable families that are, uh, on average, more uh, important than uh, others. So, uh, to conclude, uh, BILR approach provides an interpretable uh, approach to report speaker recognition uh, results. Its bottom-up process for discovering speech attributes leaves the nature of these attributes unknown. But with the, method, with the methodology that we apply in the third step to describe the nature of each attribute, we provide a phonetic meaning to each attribute. Uh, finally, the integration of human expertise is still required because just giving this, um, this uh, figure with all those information as a computer science uh, expert, I can't uh, explain what is really uh, all those descriptive variable encode as a high level uh, information. So um, the integration of uh, uh, phonetic experts is always required to interpret the combination of all those phonetic variables in terms of uh, high level speech features. Uh, so we have uh, also some work that is in uh, progress, which consists in extending the explainability of each attribute to uh, its associa association with the temporal aspect of speech. So we want to um, explain uh, each attribute and uh, understand how, what the, uh, if the presence of uh, an attribute in one speech sample is related to the, um, to the, the presence of some uh, frames and not uh, the others in one uh, in the temporal aspect. And uh, another uh, point is also that is in progress. We are working to improve the trade-off between uh, performance and explainability. And uh, we are pretty sure that it is possible to do it. So these are some uh, references for uh, my work. We have uh, two papers in uh, uh, two international um, conferences. And this is the GitHub for uh, all this work. You can, it is publicly available. You can uh, access to it. And uh, see you in the lab session in the afternoon. Thank you. Any question? Yes. 
I would have one question because there's one bit that is missing for me. I know that you have uh, already uh, said that the need of speech experts, uh, like phonetics experts, will be necessary. But there, are, there is a quite a lot of uh, papers about vocal tract uh, and its simulations. So the first thing that I'm absolutely missing here is a thing that should be immediately obvious, and that is length of the vocal tract. Length of a vocal tract is in uh, all the toolkits, HDK, very old toolkits, the first thing that obviously if you are doing some uh, classification of your speakers, it is known, you can already measure it because you have it in feature extractions and that is the first feature that you, you should be able to see there because it's not dependent on the vocal cords itself, but it's a dependent on everything that is around. And the one thing which is for your work, I believe, super important, you can change how your vocal cords work, you can pick a different pitch, you can train it, but one thing you cannot change is the length of your vocal tract that part is absolutely immutable for every person. So it is not sufficient for identification, but from the work that you have shown, that one should be spike high, because that is something that is always showing a correlation. Thank you, it's, it's very interesting to, and to know that. Th and there's uh, one thing also to that, there, there are actually quite a lot of toolkits which are simulating the vocal tract. So simulation of a vo vocal tract should be something that where you can tweak the parameters. You should be able to see which of your coefficients are related. And there's yet another thing that I would like to ask. Have you tried to take a look in a rotation of your probability space? Because you, you have shown that you have features that you extract which are sparse but those have still values between zero and one or maybe from minus infinity to infinity if you take an under logarithm. Mm. But those may be also correlated together. So rotation of that space and trying to do some SVD and looking for which dimensions are actually important and which are less important could actually help you to pick up better, uh, better features and maybe even do some operations over that in runtime where you know that there is something missing. So like choosing, choosing better dimensions, even though that you have trained them, but doing statistics about, uh, around there. Have you tried that one? No, but uh, it would be very interesting to try. Thank you. OK, <laughs> awesome. Um, thank you. Thank you for the presentations. So it was pretty good. Uh, uh, I had a question, like a pretty general one, about the motivation of the work. So uh, I was wondering whether you actually had discussions with uh, people like judges or forensic uh, real experts. Because, yeah, I mean, from my very small point of view, I would say that if I get a model that I mean, obviously, if the, date, if the testing set is good enough and close to the conditions and everything, and basically the model say, tells me that there is 99% of this person being that person or not being that person, as a judge, I would say, okay, 99%, I'll take that into account. There's this small percentage of it being false, but that's it. So h h how much is, uh, h how, um, I mean, did you have those interactions? And if you had, how do judges kind of explain this need for, like, uh, uh, I don't know, more te tangible uh, arguments or something like this? So, uh, in um, in my first in my first year, this work was uh, published in uh, a forensic conference, and it had the best paper award because they believe that it is very interesting to uh, provide this explainability aspect, especially in a forensic context. And they, um, the works that already exist until now in this field, they lack this aspect and they are always um, um, uh, uh, saying and uh, discussing about uh, the sci scientists and say that it is it is really very important to uh, provide it. Uh, yes. <laughs> uh, so um, for for this work, um, we don't uh, just say that uh, uh, we don't we we don't say that 
Uh, we provide this score and uh, that's it. So the goal is to provide more interpretability about uh, this score. And um, uh, from the point of view of uh, some um, forensic scientists, uh, it is, it, it, it's what they need until now. So I would like to compliment a little bit. Uh, you, in your question, you, are, you spoke about judges. In fact, the judges, uh, I'm going in the court law quite frequently uh, to, to, uh, to speak about the science, possibility, ability, and science limit in uh, voice identification. A judge wants a binary decision. He is the suspect is guilty or not. Uh, each time you are trying to explain there is very uncertainty, there is caution, uh, you are boring uh, the judges. So uh, in, in the feeling opinion of the judges, uh, there is absolutely no interest to add explainability in, uh, in, in a scientific decision. But for the, uh, at the opposite side, for the forensic expert, it's very important to let the decision in the province of the judge. So the forensic expert wants to give just the uh, proof of evidence as uh, right as possible, as carefully as possible. And they, as uh, Imen said, they uh, are very, very open to what we are doing. We are working with Deji Meli, which, which is one of the most known, and we just presented to Daniel Ramos, for, for uh, those who know uh, him from uh, Madrid also, uh, and they are both very interested by, uh, by his work, because it's a way to give to the lawyers the opportunity to uh, uh, attack or to, to uh, evaluate uh, the uh, scientific report. Now, for all people who uh, went in a court to do an expertise, uh, in fact, you are not speaking about science. Uh, you have question in a testimony, sometimes very, very far to the report. So at the end, the interpretability is given by uh, human uh, words. I'm not sure if I answered, but it's very important to make the difference between judge wishes and forensic expert wishes, uh, which are not the same uh, in this case. There. Sorry, uh, I have one question about the binary feature you using. Uh, is it mandatory to have a binary characteristic or not? Because uh, with the definition of the hypothesis, the prosecution and the defense uh, one, yes, it is mandatory to have. But can't you change those definitions, those uh, hypotheses? so that you can take into account non-binary features. I think it can be interesting, uh, both in terms of performances, uh, because you will lose less information, and also in terms of interpretability, because uh, when you binaries your features, you don't have the information of the model. Yes, I think it's very likely that this feature exists if uh, the value is close to one. And yes, I think maybe it's, it exists, but I'm not sure if it's close to, uh, I don't know, uh, 0.5. So can you take into account those non-binary features? So uh, for the hypothesis, they are not related to uh, binary features because those hypotheses are used to calculate the likelihood ratio, and there is not only one way to calculate the likelihood ratio. There are approaches like uh, score-based approaches and feature-based that are used in the literature, and um, they are not based on binary. It's our, solu uh, our solution that is based on uh, binary, and we think that um, the uh, binary aspect, uh, it's, it's uh, this aspect that gives the uh, interpretability. Yes, um, we can have uh, other uh, type uh, of features that could be interpretable also, but um, thanks to this uh, binary aspect, we are able, for example, to, cal to uh, um, elaborate the formula to calculate the partial LRs. They are totally based on, the, uh, on those binary uh, features. 
So this is the core of the approach we can change it. Yeah, I, I really think that the, the attribute is the good way to add explainability because you could share the explanation between a lot of cases. I agree that uh, saying, okay, the, it's 80% likely that this uh, attribute is okay for this voice, it seems attractive to us, but in the explanation, you, you will have to uh, evaluate or move your explanation if you have open eight or, or open one in this case. What we are doing is say, okay, there is presence of this uh, attribute, but now the reliability of the attribute is this one and this one, and we could give at the end, it's always my expectation, but we wish to be able to give examples in terms of interpretability, examples of the reliability to the uh, judges, advocates, and, uh, and the, the, the customers also in commercial application. So I really believe uh, the uh, trying to find if a characteristic is present or not is really a big help for explainability. Thank you. Thank you, it's a very nice talk. I have a simple question. Uh, can we read the article before interspeech? Sorry? Yeah, like, I tried to look up the article. Uh, interspeech is not yet... Uh, no, no, it's just what I'm saying. Like, the, uh, if we can read the article before in interspeech. Ah, before, okay. Uh, yes, I can send it. No problem. Awesome. Hi, uh, thanks uh, for your presentation, nice presentations. Uh, I, I just wonder if the features say that it is, uh, for, for instance, it's a female, but the person is actually a male, uh, then uh, what happened? Sorry, uh, can you repeat? I, I mean, I mean if, if the features in the speech tell us that it's a female, but the person is actually male, then uh, what, what will happen? What will happen in terms of what? Interpretability. Okay, so uh, we will have for this uh, attribute, if you mean that uh, we assume um, that uh, one attribute encode uh, female or male. So for, for this attribute, we will have um, for a given pair, for example, if it is uh, uh, present in one uh, and not uh, in, in X, if, if we have a pair X and Y, if it is present in X and not in Y, so we will have a partial LR that is negative. To say that uh, a female is uh, the female is present in the first one, but it is absent in the second. I don't know if I answered your question. I, I mean, it's, uh, if it's used in the court, for, for, ins for instance. Uh, if you use this information in the court, uh, right. So, okay. so there's some error. Then, uh, how, how do you explain to the judge, for instance? How can I explain to the judge the when there's a mismatch between the features and uh, the actual reference? Okay. One uh, question uh, Imen should add is the fact that everything we are doing is uh, based on a reference population. So uh, the, the statistics are not general statistics. It's only statistics, like in all forensic stuff, in fact, uh, linked to uh, uh, a proportion. So we don't have to take into account the fact that the a priori probability uh, could be different when you have an actual case uh, at the end. It's not our job, it's the job of a judge. Uh, the only thing we have to do is to send a report saying, okay, taking has ground truth, this database has reference population, how probabilities are this one, and we could answer this, uh, this certainty. And now the expert during the testimony will answer to a question, say, okay, if now we have only uh, women as suspects, uh, is your statistic always uh, right or not? And the uh, expert will answer, I can't answer scientifically because I don't have this in my reference population, but uh, due to my long uh, experience in the domain, I think that I'm losing 10% of uh, reliability, but I could still uh, use this or this. Um, I hope it's 
I answer to you, but uh, we could continue after. Okay, uh, thank you very much.